Next up, we have Derek Long from Eckerd Enterprises. And I have to put my glasses on because I have to read it off my phone. It's not showing up right here. <laughs> so Derek, throughout his career, Derek Long has done a large range of notes from equity appreciation, second lien notes, to the traditional first lien and mineral rights, sorry, in the oil and gas space. He is an expert in managing successful alternative investment portfolios for investors who seek to diversify. This class will be going over all the investment the average person has done in, over the last five years. Everything from multifamily, Airbnb, to oil and gas. Many people have been taken have taken advantage of but not understanding the structuring or how to evaluate these investments. Come and learn how to do your due diligence over the next opportunity and don't be sold a bad deal. Welcome, Derek. Thanks so much. Yay. Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is this the clicker? I don't know. Yes, Maybe. that's your clicker. All right. There's only two buttons, so I can't screw it up that bad. <laughs> So uh, guys, I do work with Eckerd Enterprises. We're gonna do something a little unconventional because it's a much smaller crowd. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna kind of make this more of a Q&A section. I'm not gonna go off the PowerPoint quite as much because uh, honestly, I get bored with that stuff. So my name is Derek. Uh, quick disclaimer is because I'm gonna be going over a lot of things and I'm gonna piss off a lot of people, right? And so I want you to take everything here as pretty much my opinion. You do not take this as investment advice, tax advice, legal advice, nothing along those lines. Uh, a little bit about myself real quick is, so I uh, currently work with Eckerd Enterprises. I work on their business development team and on their wealth management team. But I've worked uh, for a lot of different groups and a lot of different uh, companies as well. So previously, I actually helped run one of the largest self-directed IRA custodians out there. And in doing so, I saw more investments than you guys can ever imagine. In addition, because I saw so many investments, I actually had to study a very specific part of the tax code and revenue code, which pretty much falls under tax deferment strategies. So as much as I like to think that I'm an expert in things like oil and gas, I'm not quite there yet. I'm really not. I really want to focus on the investments that I've seen. So who here has done anything you see? A limited partnership, multifamily storage, senior living, anything along those lines? Has anyone done one of those investments? A couple people, thanks for raising your hand. What if I told you that 30% of those that I saw, 100% of them lost their capital? 30%. In addition, only 16% of those investments ever broke even. 16%. You almost have a 50% chance investing in these type of deals to lose every dollar. This is, comes from me having to review over 25,000 investments a year. And the investments we had to review weren't the good ones. It was the bad ones. What do you guys think made it a bad deal? Those damn gurus. Unfortunately, even at this conference, we have all 100% been lied to. We're all here to learn something, right? And be educated on something. Is that correct? But every person that comes up here is a salesperson. I'm here to sell you on why X investment is going to be the best investment. So I'm going to go ahead and sit up here and manipulate the data to prove to you why my investment is the best. But you guys never thought about it that way. Unfortunately, we all sit up here and you assume that whoever is up here is going to be the expert. And this is your due diligence by listening to the person here, including myself. That's your due diligence. It's terrible. So I wanna focus more today on how to do the proper due diligence to make sure this doesn't happen. Because the number one reason that people lost this type of money is they did not know how to do research, not on the investment, but on the person they're investing with. Just because you see someone on stage, you know what it costs to be up here? About 10 grand. If I could pay $10,000 to come up here and give any talk, tell you on my investment, tell you why it's the best aspect, and then you're going to assume that that's, that's correct. And that holds true for every conference in the U.S. Have you guys ever thought about it that way? Have you ever thought about me being the salesperson coming up here? So let's review 
every one of these type of real estate investment choices real quick, and we're gonna kind of keep this as an open-ended conversation. So if you have questions about one of these topics, I want you to raise your hand and I'm gonna physically call on you. Like I said, I'm gonna piss off a lot of people. Because unfortunately, I've been doing this so long and I've seen so many people lose their money due to someone selling them a bad asset. So let's go ahead and start off with a multifamily. Low-end properties, low-end from C, class C all the way up to high-end, class A. You can do new construction. You'll see sometimes they're rehabbing aspects. And from 2017 to about 2019, this was a big, big asset class. The reason it was, was a big asset class is I think the number one thing I heard across the industry was, guess what, you need to invest in multifamily because the next generation hates owning single-family homes. They don't like it, right? And apartment living's really nice, and that's where we need to live. And we don't have enough houses out there. There's not enough affordable housing, so we got to build these. This is why it's the best asset class. And 70% of the deal was debt leveraged. 70% was controlled by a bank, not even you, not even the general partner. So if I look at the pros and cons, because I think there's actually a lot of pros investing in things like multifamily. It's passive for a five years on average. I, God, I'm sorry guys, who here has invested in one of these? Someone? You guys are gonna to be too quiet no matter what I say, huh? Five years on average. Cost segregation. Cost segregation is a tax deduction aspect. You invest in these and you can go ahead and take deductions on your K-1s at the end of the year, usually year one through year four. Potential for big profits. I already told you about 50% of them either lost all their capital and broke even. But the other 50%, believe it or not, made buku bucks. I'd see people do some multifamily deals and make 20, 25% rate of return on their money. It all came back to the same thing. It wasn't the deal, it was the syndicator the person you're investing with. Some cons, it's a structure without income. If I invest $100,000 in any type of asset and I get a monthly payment, let's just say it's 100 grand, I get, next month I get 1,000 bucks. Well, I only need 99,000 now to at least break even. So I don't like that when I invest in one of these type of deals, it's a structure without income. Risk of a capital call. What's a capital call? You gotta provide more money, right? If I do the investment, there's a chance the investment goes so wrong that I actually have to give more money just to keep my position. The syndicators themselves, and lastly, there is no exit strategy. What is the exit strategy on a multifamily deal? You have to refi or sell the property. A lot of gurus out there, hey, guess what? Sign up for my coaching program. I'll teach you how to make millions and millions of dollars. Look at my fancy car, my private jet. It was all rented. And it really sucked, because I think over the last uh, about eight to 10 years, anyone could make, make money in real estate. So you had so many of these coaching programs and gurus and all this other stuff that would always just kind of pop up. And as they popped up, and it sounds like I'm kind of frustrated about it, but it's because I am. You'd have to spend 20,000, 50,000. I've seen as high as hundred thousand dollars be part of some of these groups and masterminds and programs. Has anyone seen those? You don't need that stuff. You have YouTube. You have conferences like this. Right, you can spend a couple hundred bucks, go to a good conference, and get some good education, meet some good people, right, instead of spending twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars And they sell you on why, because, well, you don't know how to read a contract. Guess what? There's free classes out there that teach you how to read a contract. Right? Check out Protect Wealth Academy. They host a free class about once a quarter on reading contracts. Huh. So let's talk about storage units. Single uh, aspects or multi-story aspects. You have uh, permits. A lot of times people don't understand what the permits really look like. Very low liability. Unlike the uh, multifamily stuff, right, we can actually have a lot of liability with this because we have a lot of tenants and a lot of things going on, where storage units, much less of a uh, liability. And we do live in America, at least in the consumer society. People like their junk. You know, we, Times I've seen and been to a storage unit conference or where someone's selling and saying, oh, the storage units are the best investments in sliced bread. And you know why? Because Americans like their junk. It's actually true, we do. So once again, pros and cons. Passive investment for five years on average. You do this investment once, for the next five years, you don't have to think about it. Potential for big profits. If you really look at the market, believe it or not, the storage unit aspects have consistently been climbing. They really have. They don't seem to really have a downturn. 
and very minimal management. You don't have a whole lot of people that are running a storage unit complex. You have usually about three or four employees at any point in time. Whereas a multifamily deal, you could have multiple people in it. Once again, structure no income, capital calls, the syndicator themselves, no exit strategy. And out of all of this, the number one reason I saw these go bad were permits. When we think of a storage unit, you have two different. You have a single story or a multi-story. When they're building a multi-story uh, storage unit aspect, the permits drastically change, and it can change very consistently. So what sucks is a lot of people lose money in, multi uh, in storage unit aspects just because the syndicator applied for the wrong permit. Wow. Short-term rentals, Airbnbs. I like these ones, but unfortunately they are very hands-on, a lot more hands-on than what you would imagine. They really are. If anyone ever tells you owning a single family home or rental property, something like that is easy, right? And it's passive income, it's, it's absolutely not. That's why you always hear the term tenants and toilets. That's an Airbnb. There's a lot of competition in the world, but it is a low level to entry. And those other deals, you have to be accredited, right? And accredited meaning you make a million, you have a million dollars in assets or make 200 grand a year, one of the two. So if I want to invest in multifamily, I have to at least already have a you know, million dollars in assets. Airbnbs, I can do things like leverage my credit. I don't have a minimum to entry. The minimum to entry is usually, well, what is the down payment on the house? Five grand, 10 grand, 50 grand, something along those lines, right? Much easier to refinance. That means we have a better exit strategy in a short-term rental. So, and they are very, very active. I like these in the aspect of I get a monthly revenue check. If I own an Airbnb, I own a rental, I have the ability to recoup the cash that I can make today. Right? Easier to exit. Right? I can put it on the market tomorrow. I can't exit those storage unit deals. I can't exit a multifamily deal. I can't exit one of these other projects that we typically see. So I like that there is a way to exit. We get to charge higher rents, and you actually own something. I can touch it, feel it, see it, look at it. Cons, though, God, they are so much more active than people think. You usually need a separate property manager just to manage these aspects. You really do. What else we got? Taxes and insurance. Anyone own single-family homes right now? How are your taxes looking, your property taxes? What about insurance costs, especially here in Florida? Very high. Very high. That's why rental income is so high right now, even if it's just a single-family rental property, non-Airbnb aspect. There is a ton of competition. We always say Airbnb right? VRBO, there's a lot of other platforms you can utilize, but it is. And then lastly, the HOA. Damn those bastards. Ugh. Anyone here like the HOA? Is your name Karen? They raise their hand. What the hell's wrong with the guy with the mohawk? God. You thought it'd be interesting. Thanks, Kurt. That's Kurt Power from Inspira Financial. <laughs> So, loves to give me crap. Grr. I'm skinny and, though, well, about 145 pounds. He's like 250 pounds of muscle, so I can't, I can't do anything about it. So, anyways, oil and gas investments, mainly mineral rights. Remember, I was overseeing a large retirement company. So, when we talk about retirement accounts, such as self-directed IRAs, solo 401ks, you don't see people use those accounts to invest in drilling for oil. They usually use them to invest in mineral rights. Mineral rights is real ownership. You get a monthly check. It is a long time hold though. No capital calls. Problem is you have no clue what the hell a mineral right is. What is a mineral right? Anyone? Mine is the oil and gas expert in the front of the room. <laughs> so pros and cons of mineral rights. Real ownership, monthly checks, no capital calls, no liability. And when you, once you own a mineral right, you get a tenant for 25 years, possibly longer. But I'm gonna go on the low one and stick with a 25 year lease. I wish I could buy a rental property and have a tenant sign a 25 year lease with me. I'd feel very comfortable then, you know? Problem is I tell people you need to expect to hold it for at least five years. Can you exit earlier? Absolutely you can but you should have a mindset to own these assets for a minimum of five years. If you do need to exit, it's gonna take you 60 days on average. 
Okay? So we're going to talk a little bit more about why we saw these so much. And I think it really comes down to the cost to hold these type of assets. If we think of single family homes, right? we think of commercial properties, short term rentals, self storage. All of these are the holding costs it takes. Every single one of these. HOA fees, insurance. And I want to guess what it costs to hold the mineral right, especially if you buy the correct ones. Zero. Zero holding cost. Now, there are some that will, you will have a small property tax aspect that you have to pay at the end of the year. But overall, that can either be taken out of the revenue or uh, you just deal with it. And we're talking a couple hundred bucks versus thousands and thousands of dollars. So most of the time, there's going to be a zero holding cost. So you always want to review and figure out which ones to buy. Benefits. Guys, I started this whole conversation by telling you who up here, whoever is up here is a salesperson. So what do you think I'm doing? I'm selling you on why you need to own minerals, and I'm going to go ahead and manipulate all the data and tell you this is the best investment since sliced bread. But you know why? It's because I actually believe it. Most of the time, the people that come up here, when you think of a sales guy, you think of uh, the car salesman, right? That's not really the case. Average salespeople, they actually believe in the product they're selling. They believe in the asset that's there, and because of that, that's why they're so passionate about it. That's why they like to come up here and they like to educate, aka sell you, on why these are the best thing. So if I look at mineral rights, guess what? It is real property. If you choose to buy them, you actually typically are buying them, I'm going to label it as buy the acre, and I'll give you an example in just a minute. So we buy them by the acre. No expenses, no capital calls. It's a one-time check. You never have to shell out more money for your investment again. Never. There's not a monthly aspect. There's not a quarterly or annual. Never again do you have to pay anything else to own the minerals. It's the reserves that are down there for decades and decades and decades. That's why these people, these oil companies that are drilling on those mineral rights are signing a 25-year lease with you. No liability. Taylor, I'm literally giving a speech on stage. I'm going to pass the phone to Thomas. Whoop. Look at that. <laughs> mineral owners are at the top of the distribution chain when you invest in some of those other deals especially if they are debt leveraged what happens when these deals are debt leveraged who's the first person to get paid you the investor or the bank after the bank the second person to get paid is you the investor or the general partner the guy that's running the deal you're actually third fourth fifth aspect down the road that's a problem so if you actually buy the proper mineral rights you are the very first person you're at the top of the food chain no liability you will never be sued all right for oh i slipped and fell on your minerals and now you owe me a bunch of money does not exist if you've been able to own minerals for well over 100 years and there's not a single lawsuit out there you'll find where someone's suing you because they got hurt on your mineral rights you know who they sue the oil and gas company that's drilling for oil. So what does a mineral right look like? I always like to bring this slide up because many times we think if you're going to invest in oil and gas, it looks like something like that right there. It's those big pump jacks that you see that are pumping out oil out of the ground on a co consistent basis. That is drilling for oil. And we're going to talk about the difference in a little bit. If you want to invest in that aspect, you'll make way more money. If you want to invest in the drilling side, you get tax deductions and you can make literally 100, 200, 300% rate of return on your cash. You really can. You take on a lot more risk though. So a mineral right investment actually looks a lot more like this. Usually what will happen is you'll have a physical package given to you. And if you look at the map, there's some red circles on there and that's saying, hey, this is your sections that you own. Before you ever buy them though, They'll tell you, hey, look, right here, and this is one that I, I purchased back in November. So this, is, uh, this investment's not actually available or anything like that. I physically purchased this one. There is 39 wells that is currently pumping out oil, producing oil, meaning the day you buy it, you get paid. I don't have to wait. I don't have to worry about, oh, what happens if they drill and there's no oil down there? That does not exist. They're already pumping out oil. 
In addition, though, they have eight. Does that say eight? It does say. Oh, there's a big screen right in front of me. Look at that. Eight wells that are drilled, but they haven't started pumping yet. They haven't turned them on. So it tells me that, look, there's future revenue up there as well. Last is these same oil companies have even applied for additional permits at the state to continue adding more wells on your area, on your mineral rights. Now, I'm making them sound really attractive. Why? Because I'm the sales guy. But what's the problem? It's right here. And Thomas is sitting up here. I'm going to rely on him maybe a little bit. And so correct me if I'm wrong. I want to say these were $12,500 an acre. Very reasonable. There's only 500 acres available. Because this is labeled as real estate, the IRS will let you do a 1031 exchange to avoid taxes to buy it. You can use a self-directed IRA. You can buy them personally or in an LLC, doesn't matter. So the thing is, is when I look at these aspects, there's only 500 acres available at $12,000 an acre. That's gonna come out to about 15 million bucks. Someone sells an apartment complex, they'll buy the whole package and you don't get anything. They also very rarely become available. So once they do become available, you have to pretty much move quickly. Does that give you enough time to do your due diligence? Nope. So how do you do due diligence on these? You want to ask for track records. Before you ever buy mineral rights, who's ever selling them to you, you want to say, hey, can you give me a track record? Can you show me the last 500 investments that you've done? Throw out a random number. I don't care. You choose. If they can't give you a track record, probably run the other way. So this is what's really, really, really nice about this aspect. You guys are quiet. There's supposed to be Q&A too. If you guys have any questions, let me know. I always get the question, the first one I get, well, Derek, what happens if they drill for oil and there's no oil down there? That is old thinking. Nowadays, they don't do vertical drilling anymore. They do what they call is horizontal drilling. They used to drill straight down. And if there's oil down there, yay. If there's not, that sucks to be you. You lost all your money. That's why oil and gas investing was so risky. But nowadays, they don't do that. What they do is they drill down, and they go sideways. And they go miles until they can get you the reserves you need. So this is the new question. Hmm? Absolutely they can. Absolutely. She goes, can they cross the boundary of the land you bought? Hell yeah, they can. But most of the time they won't. This is because of something that they call as a pooling aspect. If I go back to boop, boop, this right here, these 500 mineral uh, acres, their net mineral acres available, they fall, because uh, this one was in Oklahoma, into what they call as a pool. It doesn't matter if you own acre A or acre Z, you all receive the same royalty percentage of every barrel of oil that's pulled out of the ground because of the horizontal drilling. It wouldn't be fair if they're drilling for oil over there, but they're sucking out oil over there. That's not fair. So the state says, hey, look, nope, if you're in these sections and this is where you're drilling and pumping out oil, everyone has to receive the same royalty. Doesn't matter. Good question. See, now we got some Q&As coming. People are brave. So I always tell people I like to own these, and I probably saw them so much when I was with a uh, IRA company because it was real property. It was deeded entitled to you, the individual. I love that aspect. With zero liability from the exploration costs, the operating expenses, property taxes, capital calls, no holding cost. It is literally the most passive investment you guys can ever find. Is it the most attractive investment? Nope. Not at all. You'll never hear someone brag about their monthly check they get from a mineral right. It's like owning an annuity or owning a CD or something. No one brags about their damn CDs. No one cares. They really don't. But I like to know that I get a monthly check consistently. And I think that's the most important aspect. Because if I do an investment, the first question you should ask is, how do I retain and get my capital back? If I do this investment and I invest 100 grand, I want to know that I can make it back. And if I only make back 99,000, 
at least it decreases the risk. So let's figure out what it takes and how long is it going to take to make that money back. Now, there's two different ways really to invest in oil and gas outside of just buying stocks. One is what's called working interest. And the other one is mineral rights. And I really wanted to take a minute and touch on this as well, because working interest is high risk, high reward. Anyone ever hear that like, oh, investing in oil and gas is risky? That's the working interest. You are physically investing in the drilling side. I'm going to go, I'm going to invest in someone drilling for oil. That's very risky, but it's also very rewarding. It really is. I've seen people make millions and millions of dollars on this aspect. Because of the risk, though, you get very large tax deductions. The IRS knows how risky it is because so the minute you do it, you can usually deduct 70 to 80 percent of your investment instantly. I invest 100 grand, I can take an $80,000 tax write off this year. That's badass. It really is. It's the most common way to invest, which is scary because this is why it's also so risky is if I am the driller, I'm the guy that's raising the money, I want you to invest everything in me and I'm going to sell you on the tax deduction side. But look, if you do this investment, you get an $80,000 tax deduction and it's taken right off your adjusted gross income. So how much money do you think you save in taxes? Anyone? Someone answer, I'm going to sit here. 80%? I'll take it. That's wrong. It's way wrong. I'm going to show you exactly how much you save. Okay. You also have a capital call. You're guaranteed to have a capital call at some point in time. This is, can be a good thing, though. Usually, if you're with a good company and there's a capital call, it means they're going to add new wells. So they go, hey, do you want to keep working with us? There's a capital call. There could also be the bad capital calls where they go, hey, we screwed up something. You've got to put more money in, otherwise you'll lose your position. Mineral rights, very low risk, real ownership, no capital calls, and a monthly payment. So I can't find one asset out there, I really can't, that can compare. There's not one out there where you get that type of money on a consistent basis. <sighs> this sucks. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about the tax deductions that you guys are getting ready to lose. Anyone watch the debate that, uh, just the other night? How do you think it went? Yeah, you see, she's like, damn, I shouldn't have said anything. That sucks. Lies. Lies. Guys, I'm ex-military. I spent six years in the Army. My dad, oh, he said, oh, there it is. I heard it. <laughs> I always hear hoorah. I was like, that's not Army, man. Good luck. I was an Apache mechanic. You know what that translates to the civilian world? Zero. <laughs> it really does. I have all this knowledge and this training on these Apache helicopters, the most deadly helicopter in the world. And, in the, and once you become a civilian, it means absolutely nothing. But because of that, I also live in Texas. I love real estate, and I work for an oil and gas company. What side of the fence do you think I fall on when it comes to politics? <laughs> it's extreme left, he says. The problem is, though, Unfortunately, I think it doesn't matter what side you vote for. We got some monkeys running the show. We really do. It sucks. I'll probably always vote red. I really will. But it's because of my background. It's because of what I've seen and, and other aspects to it. First question that was asked, uh, if you watched the debate, was to Kamala. And she, uh, the question was, do you think we're in a better economy today than we were four years ago? She did not answer. It was a simple yes or no question. And if I was the one debating her on that and I was Trump in that specific situation, you know what my first question would have been? Because they, they each got two minutes and their mics were off, right? So boop, Kamala talked for two minutes and it switched back over to Trump. And he's supposed to give a rebuttal to what, you know, the same question. And I would have been like, hey, you know what, Kamala, you actually didn't answer the question. You gave a big runaround. It's a simple yes or no. Can you tell us, and I'll, I'll pass the mic back to you, do you think we're in a better economy, yes or no? That's exactly what I would have said. Unfortunately, Trump instead attacks, right? Talks about people eating cats and dogs. I was like, wait, what the hell's going on? Can we talk about the taxes? Can we talk about immigration? Can we talk about something that's where you're not attacking each other? If you go back and you actually watch the debate between uh, Clinton and... Uh, um, 
Oh my God. Huh? Bush, thank you, thank you. They walked out on stage, they shook each other's hands, right? And it was a much more civilized debate. We are not in that type of country. It's now talking about social media and I don't know, random stuff. And it hurts. It does. And we're on the verge of losing a lot of tax deductions, especially in the oil and gas industry. I just told you that if you invested in the drilling side for oil and gas, you can get a 70 to 80% tax deduction right off the bat. It's been this way since pretty much 1980 something. I'm going to say 84. I could be wrong. So don't quote me on that. If Kamala gets in, there's a strong probability this tax deduction goes away. If this tax deduction goes away, oil prices will skyrocket because no one will want to invest in the drilling side, meaning we're not pumping out oil anymore. You know what oil and gas is primarily used for? Bam, plastic. Every ounce of plastic in today's society is created from a barrel of oil. Every ounce of plastic. Before I started working for an oil and gas company, I just related oil and gas to what goes in my car, right? That's crazy, because that's actually such a small amount of it. And if you talk to real oil and gas experts, I always hear, oh, what about the green energy movement? Dude, we need it. We absolutely need it. The problem is, it's being manipulated in the wrong ways by our politicians. It sucks. It really does. You could do so good if, if we all could put our differences aside. Oil and gas is a depleting asset. I mean, if I have a million barrels of oil and tomorrow I only have 900,000 barrels of oil, what's the price? It's more. It's a supply and demand. So if this tax deduction goes away, you're going to see your oil prices skyrocket. Skyrocket. Guys, I invest in oil and gas. I told you I'm red. Right? I probably always will be because of my background. Do you think as an investor in oil and gas, I want prices to be 50 bucks a barrel under a Republican power or $150 a barrel under a Democratic power? What do you guys think? 50? Why 50? I'm making more money per barrel of oil. Volume. I like it. So he's correct. But really, to me, it doesn't matter. What happens when you invest in oil and gas is every time they sell a barrel of oil on your mineral rights, you get a percentage of that money. So if they sell it for $150 a barrel, you're making more money. I like this. I like to know that no matter what, on the, under Democratic rule, I make more money per barrel of oil. But under Republican rule, what ends up happening is they're going to pump out instead of one barrel of oil, they're going to pump out three. It's the same damn thing. So it's unbelievable how investing in oil and gas can actually be recession proof from that standpoint. It's incredible. And it's because we are so reliant on this aspect. So if this tax deduction goes away, you're gonna see your oil prices skyrocket. You really will. I always wanna look at both these asset classes from working interest to mineral rights. Working interest, if you choose to ever invest in the drilling side, on average, you're going to see the revenue start about a year from now, give or take. For mineral rights, you usually get your first uh, income checks in between six to eight months. Now, you're still getting paid during that whole time. It's just the state has to pretty much recognize you as the new mineral owner. So it takes a little bit of time. So kind of think of your money as sitting in an escrow account. So your first check's always going to be the largest because it's six months worth of revenue. But then after that, you get a monthly check. The working interest side, tax deferral aspects, if you choose to ever invest in it. Whereas minerals, no liability, no capital calls, therefore, no tax deduction. If you're not taking a lot of risk, the IRS doesn't give you those. Monthly income from the drilling side for 15 years, mineral rights, really income for life. It really is. The reason I'm spending so much time on this is you guys are about to see Thousands of oil and gas investments pop up out of nowhere. People reactivating a well, old wells because it's cheaper. People drilling vertical wells, not horizontal, because it makes more liability sense. It does not. And you're going to see all these because they're going to scare you with the tax deductions. 
I started this talk by telling you I am a salesperson. I want you to invest in mineral rights. I want you to invest in drilling. I've worked with every single vendor out there. I've become not hated, that's not the right word, but I'm usually too blunt. And it's scary, and I think it scares people. And it becomes just how we use our verbiage. I asked you the question earlier, if I invested 100 grand, I could take an 80% tax deduction, and that's what we're sold, especially if you choose to invest in certain projects. You told me you, that's an 80% savings on taxes. It's wrong. As a matter of fact, I even created a nice little chart for you. If I invested, and I'm going to use, I think I put a million, but yeah, it's a million dollars. I take $800,000 as a tax deduction. I save $296,000 in taxes. But you heard an $800,000 tax deduction. Really what you saved is closer to about $300,000 in taxes. And people don't realize this, and it's because it's oversold. If you're going to be doing investment because someone's selling you on the tax deduction side, you need to run. You first should be asking, how do I make my money back? If you're going to look for a tax deduction, go burn the money or just pay the IRS anyways. Give it to a charity. Find a charity you like and give the money that way for your tax deductions. The first question always needs to be, how can I make my money back? So what I did, and this is my last slide, guys, is I put up what I consider to be the top 25 questions you need to ask every person out there at every conference, at every guru aspect that you go to before you ever make an investment choice. And if they do not answer every one of these questions, you run. How much should you invest? Why do you think you should ask that question? Thomas, I have a million dollars today. How much of my million dollars should I put into your current mineral package? It depends. I like it. Can you tell me why it depends? So did you hear that? He's telling me that it all depends on what are my goals, what are my objectives, and instead of taking a million bucks from me, right, I'm going to give you a mic just in case, because I'm probably going to ask you a whole bunch of questions. I'm sorry. He's a real oil and gas expert. That guy, man, if you ever have a chance to sit down with Thomas, you need to. He worked on rigs. He has some crazy stories. And that is an engineer from Godson. His wife's a petroleum engineer, too. So I can't imagine those conversations at the dinner table. <laughs> but how much to invest? I think that's a very important question to ask, because sometimes people are going to tell you, well, how much you got in your checking account? How long do you get your principal back? If I do an investment, I want to know how long do I make all my money back? I think it's very important. What's the risk of the investment? How do you, the investor, make your money? What is my investment exactly? I think this one's very important. A lot of times we get sold by a great salesperson and you have no clue what the hell your investment is. Not at all. You don't even know what it is. You invested in a person, not an asset. How liquid is the asset? Who is the person you're investing in? I think this is actually one of the most important questions you need to be asking because unfortunately, most of the people are in it for themselves. They don't care about your rate of return. They really don't. They're gonna tell you everything and anything you need to hear. They absolutely are. What is the value today versus my value tomorrow? If I do these investments, how do I know I'm going to make money today and tomorrow? Does my investment increase in value? Does it decrease in value? It's okay if it decreases, that's not a problem, but I wanna make sure I'm making enough capital along the way. What are the tax benefits? What ways can you invest? The one of the biggest things though that you guys don't ask, I have it in bold, number 11, what is your track record? What is your track record? A lot of you guys out there have done investments 
based off the person at the front of the room who paid to be there, who got, I paid money to sit on this stage and sell you on why, I'm sorry, educate you on why this investment's the best investments in sliced bread. So I'm going to pick apart every other investment, tell you they're all crappy. And it sucks. But you know why I feel comfortable doing it? The company I get to represent has one hell of a track record. When I was literally sitting there running a retirement company, I got to see every single person's investment, every single one of them. Me and my wife made a ton of money by cherry picking investments, by letting you guys take the risk. Isn't that messed up? I'd be dumb if I didn't take that advantage. You guys invest in a bunch of different sponsors. I waited and that person says they, can, they say they can do what they do. Boop. I'm going to invest with them. There's about five sponsors out there that I trust that I would invest everything with. And almost no questions asked. Ask me on the sideline, I'll tell you exactly who they are. Eckerd Enterprises is 100% one of them. Why would someone sell this investment if it's so good? Why doesn't everyone else do it? Why don't other people do it? If it's so easy for you to raise the capital, if it's so easy for you to make the money, why doesn't everyone else do this? What is your buy box? How do you find your investments? Can you tell me? Can you walk me through it? I love this one. How does the person at the front of the room get paid? I want to know exactly what's in it for you. If I'm up here and I'm going to sell you on insert asset, apartment complexes, storage units, whole life insurance policies, I don't care. What's your commission? What do you get? Can you tell me? How uncomfortable do you think that conversation is for some people? Should it matter? Ultimately, it shouldn't matter. It really doesn't. But if someone's scared to answer that question, that's a problem. Would you agree? Why do you think they're scared to answer it? Because they're taking too much of the deal. Huh. Interesting. How long does the investment last? What happens if the syndicator disappears? Oof. If I own this investment, I want to know what would happen if it disappears. And I'm going to be done in about two minutes, just so you're aware. So. I think this one's really important because a lot of times we do and we get stuck in these investments and no one even thinks to ask this. Well, what happens if you die? Why does you get hit by a bus? It happens. So make sure we're asking these type of questions. Do you have any SEC violations? How do political aspects affect my investment? No one could have ever predicted COVID. No one. But it suddenly affected all my real estate assets. In oil and gas, you know what happened? Oil went down to virtually zero, in some cases negative. What if I told you we were excited about that? Because when do you buy stocks? When do you buy an asset? When it's at $150 a barrel of oil or when it's at a negative dollar? You want to talk about people making money like that? Oh, I could buy it, wait six months, wait for COVID to be over, and I'm going to be a billionaire. And that happened. It really did. This is why I think oil and gas is actually one of those almost recession-proof style industries. I really do. So... I got a phone number up here. You guys can text it if you'd like. All right. We're going to be heading out here very shortly. You know, we, we got to get back to Texas. We really do. But, but you can text this. And I just want to end on a little story. Is I had the chance to meet uh, Warren Buffett at a conference. You know, I didn't get to sit down and have dinner with him personally or anything like that. But he told this little story. So I'm going to totally 100% steal this story. And he was telling me this story. He was telling the audience this story about when in 1968, him and his friend, Russell Thomas, all right, were going through, and they were friends all the way in the 60s, and they were talking about starting businesses, and they kind of maintained that relationship. They started in real estate. They made a lot of money in real estate. They made a lot of money doing a lot of other small business aspects. And 2008 rolled around. Still in the same car, Russell Thomas talking to him. And Russell Thomas was so heavily invested in real estate that he said, man, I'm screwed what do you think they were talking about in the 2008 time frame? The downfall, right? Everyone's losing their money. There's all these foreclosures, all these aspects. And Warren Buffett was actually very, very calm. 
And he goes, hey, do you remember when we started business back in the 60s? Do you know what the number one selling candy bar in 1968 was? Anyone know? I like that you said Hershey's, but it's Snickers. Snickers. Is that your wife? He just found it. He just found his. Oh, he's like, ah, I told you, I told you. Ah, you got it right. Snickers was the number one selling candy bar in 1968. You know what the number one selling candy bar is today? Snickers! Come on, you got to know where the story was going. Snickers! The whole point of it was Warren Buffett's like, look, relax. If you're in the right type of asset class, it doesn't matter. If you're partnered with the right individual, if you're working with the right people, you're going to make money. You can make money with any asset class out there, but you need to understand it. You need to make sure you have a good partnership. You need to make sure that you can ask those top 25 questions and don't be scared to ask. And I leave you with this. I am a salesperson, and so is every person that will come on this stage and every other event you ever go to. We all have paid to be up here. We don't come up here to educate you by the goodness of our hearts, as much as I'd, you'd like to think that. But every person that will come up here is here to sell you on why their class, their investment, that is the best thing for you. So thank you for your time. I, ended, I tried to save up some time a little bit, so I'm out, guys. Appreciate it.